Heavenly Father, we pray that you open our hearts to the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Cleanse us through and through. Amen. Take every corruption away. Amen. And the tendency to compromise, take that away in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us stand by the word of God. Amen. That Lord, by your grace and your strength, will keep the standard of the word in our lives, in our families, in the ministry, in the whole church. Confirm your word in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless every one of you. You can sit down. Today we're looking at uh, Revelation chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 12. That's what we're studying today. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 12. It says, And to the angel of the church in Pagamos, right. This six says he that has the sharp sword, with two edges, I know thy works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwellest. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou wast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his tumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So as thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which sin I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, and overcomers in the house tonight. Yeah. To him that overcometh, will I give to it of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving that is except he that receiveth it. Tonight, as we look at those verses of scripture, we find Christ, the head of the church, talking to the church, the church in Pagamos, and is uh, reminding the minister there, the angel of the church, of what his uh, activities and what his doctrine, what his teaching, what his ministry has been, and what he ought to be. And he's talking to the members too of that church. And then he's talking to the people through the minister and through the members. He's talking to the rest of the people in that city, the rest of the people in every nation, and the rest of the people in the world. Want to understand that Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he said before, he's still saying today. What he did before, he's still doing today. What he hated before, he still hates today. And what he loved before, he still loves today. What he commanded before, he still commanding today. What he commended before and said, this is good, that is good. He has not changed. What he commended before, he still commends today. As we look at this, he's writing to the church. And we have emphasized that it has a personal and present application. And it has a prophetic anticipation as well. As he spoke to the people of the past, he's still speaking to us today. Look at that verse 12. It says, and to the angel. We have emphasized over and over that that's not an angel in heaven. It's the angel over here in the church. To the angel of the church, the church in that city, the church in that location, and the church in that vicinity. It says, to the angel of the church. Why did he call the minister the angel of the church? We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and in verse 3, it tells us the place of the minister, the place of the children of God. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, Know ye not that we shall judge the angels? We're not too far apart. 
We're servants of God. Angels are servants of God, and we ministers are servants of God. Angels are holy and righteous, and we are also supposed to be holy and righteous. Angels run the errands for God, and they run the ministry. They run whatever God tells them to do. They do it swiftly and obediently, and that's what is expected of the minister. That's why he says, don't you know, if we do our work very well, if we carry out the ministry very well, that even we, we shall judge the angels. And if we're going to judge the angels, it says then, we ourselves should live obedient lives like angels should live, holy lives like angels should live. Because if you are disobedient, how can you judge the obedient? If you are rebellious, how can you judge the righteous? If you are sinful, how can you judge the saintly? And if you are not listening to the word of the Lord, how will you judge the angels that are listening to the word of the Lord? That's why it says, to the angel of the church. Now when he talks about the church, he's talking about the members. The first part is talking to the minister, unto the angel. Now of the church, because he's sending that minister, he's sending the minister to the members of the church. And what is the church supposed to be? What is the church supposed to look like? And when those ambassadors of Christ, the angels of Christ, the angels of the church, when they are ministering, what should they have in mind as to what the church ought to be? We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, that he gave himself for it. That's the church. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That's the church. That he might present it. That's the church. Present that church to himself. What kind of church? A glorious church. It says, ministers, don't you ever forget this. You have an assignment and you have a duty. You have a responsibility unto the angel, unto the leader, unto the pastor, unto the minister of the church. Now, that angel, that minister, that ambassador of Christ must understand why he is there and what kind of church is supposed to raise up and what kind of church is supposed to present unto Christ. That's why it says, is that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish if that is the state and the standard that Christ expects of the church when it comes to examine our work when it comes to examine our ministry when it comes to examine how we're carrying out our duty is going to find out the church that you pastor the church that I pastor the church that you minister to how is that church I it in life how is it in doctrine? How is it in ministry? How is it in every area? It's going to examine. That's why he writes all these churches to the church in Ephesus and to the church in Esmana and to the church in Pagamos and to the church in Tatira, to the church in to the church in Sardis and to the church in Philadelphia and to the church in, um, in uh, Laodicea. Right. Now as we're talking about the church, look at the state. He wants the church to be Ephesians church chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. It says, according as he has chosen us, those who are chosen out of the world, those who are saved out of the world, those whose sins are forgiven, and those who are chosen by Christ, and now they're in the church, it says, according as he has chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be, tell me the word there, holy and without blame before him in love. That's the church, what the church ought to be. And while you are ministering to the church, say, that's my goal, that's my intention, that's my calling. The church is supposed to be holy and without blame in love. Look at chapter 2 there. Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 21, the church in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into an holy temple in the Lord. That's what he wants the church to be. He wants the church like uh, lit blocks, little, little members, little, little blocks, all built together to become a temple, an habitation of the Lord, and it's a holy habitation. It's a holy temple. Look at verse 22. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. He wants to live in us. He wants to live with us. He wants to dwell within us and he wants that church to be holy 
that church to be blameless. We're looking at chapter 3, verse 5. It says in chapter 3, reading from verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. He's talking about the ministers and those, those are the people the Lord Jesus Christ referred to to the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, to the angel of the church in a Pagamos rite. And he says they're holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You see, that's why if you're a minister, understand he calls you an angel and he wants you to be holy. And then he wants you to minister to the members of the church and get them Holy. We're looking at chapter 4, and I'm reading here from verse 24. Chapter 4 of um, Ephesians, uh, chapter 4, verse 24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, and tell me the rest true holiness. You see the church, as we're looking at it from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3 and then to chapter 4, it says this should be the characteristics of the church, that it should be holy. That means then the angel of the church, if you forget your duty, you think it's just preaching. It's preaching for a purpose. You, you forget your duty, you, you say it's just holding services. We're there on Sunday, we're there on Monday, we're there on Thursday and we're there on Saturday for the workers meeting, workers training and then you are just there what's the goal what's the approach what are you trying to do you're trying to raise up a church a church that is solely the angel of the church the leader of the church in pagamos forgot that that's why corruption came in that's how compromise came in look at chapter 5 here in chapter 5 verse 27 it says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so then, as you look at chapter 6, we're looking at verse 10. Chapter 6, verse 10, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. If you're going to fight corruption, you have to be strong. Be strong in the Lord. If you're going to stand against compromise, you have to be strong. Be strong in the Lord. If you're going to raise up the church the way the church ought to be and there'll be no carelessness, there'll be no corruption, there'll be no compromise, there'll be no evil and there'll be no occultism and there'll be no backsliding and the people are going to stand holy and unblameable, you have to be strong. If you are weak in your mind and weak in your spirit and weak in your heart and weak in your understanding of the scriptures, are you going to raise up a strong church? A weak man, a weak minister trying to raise up a strong church, an unholy minister trying to raise up a holy church and uh, somebody who does not have real conviction of backbone and he cannot stand, he wants to raise up a church that is standing impossible. You have to be strong. That's why it says uh, finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Somebody there will get stronger today. More courageous today in Jesus name. Let's come back here now. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 12. Unto the angel, we've explained that, of the church, well, we've explained that in Pagamos. In Pagamos. That was a city. History tells us that it was the commercial capital of Asia Minor. Not only that, it was the very seat of idol worship in Asia Minor. Look at what Jesus said. Look at verse 13. I know thy was, and where thou dwellest. He's talking to the minister, where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seat is, that is Pagamos, is like a little world. Pagamos was the miniature of a world where you have Satan and his activities, where you have Satan and all his afflictions, where you have Satan and all the worldliness, where you have Satan and all the occultism, where you have Satan and all the idolatry. It says, I know where you dwell, even where Satan's siege is. Look at the last line of that verse 13, where Satan dwelleth. That's a picture of the world. And every church is in the world. Every church is in the world. Let me give you this understanding of the church. For example, when you build a boat or you build a ship, the ship is built for the water. That is, the ship 
must be on the water. There's no point building a ship and then there's no river, there's no ocean, there's no water, nothing at all. But you build the ship must be on the water. And uh, the same thing with the church. The church is in the world. The church is in the world. But the problem comes when water that should be outside at the bottom of the ship now is leaking into, uh, into the boat. And the leaking boat, the leaking ship will soon sink. The same thing. The church is in the world, but it's not of the world. And as long as we keep that distinction that the church is there in Pagamos, the church is there in Tatira, the church is there in Laodicea, the church is there in the world, no problem. Everything is all right. But when the world now comes into the church, the world comes into the church. The courtism in the world comes to the church. The corruption in the world comes to the church. The bribery in the world comes to the church. And the peculiarities of the world that makes them dirty and filthy comes to the church. That's where the problem actually lies. That's why as we look at this study today, we're looking at Christ's warning against corruption and compromise. Christ's warning against corruption and compromise. It may be a little hole that is dug into the sheep and then because of that the water is seeping, the water is coming slowly and slowly and if we don't uh, close up uh, that hole the water will soon feel that boat, will soon feel the sheep and sink the sheep. I pray that our church will not sink. We're going to remain above the world. We're going to remain free from the world. And the Lord will keep us free and steady and will be uncompromising in Jesus' name. Tonight, we're looking at Christ's warning against what? Against corruption and what? And compromise. Christ's warning against corruption and compromise. There are three points we're looking at. Number one, the compelling identification of Christ. The compelling identification of Christ. Here, Christ introduces himself, and it's a compelling introduction, a compelling identification of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, the corrupting influence in the church. Something happened. This church, I mean the church in Pagamos, became corrupted. They went into compromise. The influence that came on them, the influence that corrupted them, the corrupting influence in the church. And then point number three, the crowning inheritance of conquerors. That's why you are going, you are going to be a conqueror. Point number one, tell me number one. The compelling identification of Christ. Look at this. We're looking at Revelation chapter uh, 2. And I'm reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pagamos write, These things says he that has the sharp sword with two edges. He's talking about himself. He's introducing himself. And what a compelling identification this is of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, This is he. He's still alive. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. And then he went to heaven. And he said, I'm still alive. And this is he, the head of the church. This is he, the savior of the world. This is he, the judge of the whole earth. And he says, I have the two, I have the two edged sword. Look at chapter 1, verse 16. Chapter 1, verse 16. It says, And he had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. Uh, that's surprising, but understand this revelation about the Lord Jesus Christ. Normally, soldiers at that time, and even soldiers today, they carry the sword in their hand because it's something physical. But in his own case, the sword is coming from the mouth, and it is the word of judgment. It's the word that is furious against the unbelievers and against the sinners and against the backsliders and against the compromisers. Look at chapter 2, verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 10 repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will what's the next word there? Fight against them with what? The sword of my mouth. That means that sword is a sword of judgment. Is the sword that cuts down the unbelievers. If finally, if they do not repent, is a sword that cuts down the backsliders and uh, the corruptors and the corrupted. If they do not repent, chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 15. 
chapter 19, we're looking at verse 15. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and that it might, and that uh, with it he should smite the nations. And he should, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. So then, you understand when it says, "This is He, He that is going to judge is the final judge." This is He, He that is going to bring a judgment upon the compromisers, and it's the omniscient, omniscient, all-knowing Judge. He knows everything about everyone. He knows everything about the angel of the church in Pagamos. He knows everything about the members of the church in Pagamos. He knows everything about the citizens and the sinners in the city of Pagamos. And he knows everything about every minister today. He knows everything about every member of the church today. And he knows everything about all the people around the world today. And then he tells us, come to chapter, come to chapter 2. And I'm reading here again from uh, Revelation chapter 2 verse 13. It says, I know thy works. I know thy works. Have you noticed that as you come to the church in Ephesus, Jesus said, I know thy works. As he comes to the church in Smyrna, I know thy works. And he talks to the church in Pagamos, I know thy works. And every one of those churches, I know thy works is a God of knowledge. He has insight to what is done in the secret and what is done in the public. He has insight to what is done by everyone, every minister. He, know, he has insight about what is done by all members of the church. He has insight about what is done by even the unbelievers, the sinners in the world. It's a God of knowledge and he reveals secrets. There's nothing secret you can be hiding somewhere that he will not know. He knows your thought. He knows your imagination. He knows your action. He knows he knows your habit. He knows your lifestyle. He knows the common things you do. He knows the uncommon specific things you do. Because I know thy works. In Daniel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 22. Daniel chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 22. Look at what he's saying about God. And the same thing we say about Christ. Because every time he says, I know. He reveals the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is done in darkness. He knoweth what what is done in darkness and the light dwelleth with him about our Christ he knows that's why Peter said Lord you know all things you know that I love you if you don't love him he knows if you're pretending he knows if you're a hypocrite he knows if you're sincere he knows if you're born again you're saved he knows if you are saved but you, you say you are saved but you're not living the life he knows you cannot hide anything from him he revealed deep the deep and the secret things he knows what is done in darkness and the light dwelleth with him uh, we're looking at hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 talking about this christ who is going to judge every action who is going to judge every work who is going to examine everything and then he's going to reward every man or recompense everyone according to his deeds he's telling us in hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 it says neither is any creature that is not manifest in his sight think about that neither is any creature that is not manifest in his sight you know, there are some people that maybe they're into witchcraft and uh, somebody is coming out of witchcraft and uh, the person is saying, so-and-so is also there, so-and-so is also there. They say, no, I don't know anything about it. Neither is any creature hidden in his sight. And if the person does not repent, eventually he dies like a witch. He might be going to church or coming to church, might be reading the Bible, but he never repents of that uh, witchcraft. And when he could have repented, when somebody said, it's what I was there and now I'm born again I've come out and so and so was there because he wants to keep a good name because he wants to keep a good position in uh, his church or maybe any church he says no I'm not there if you die in that condition witches will not get to heaven they go to hell and it says in that verse 13 neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight the times people have committed immorality adultery, fornication and then the, uh, the partner in sin said I'm repenting, I want to go to heaven uh, well, even if the church will rebuke me I'm ready for that rebuke and then they said who did you do this and he says, says, says so and so and they call the 
demand. They say, uh, hi, about this. He said, I don't even know the woman. Have we ever met before? Did I ever talk to you? Where did you see me? Where did I do that? And the woman is uh, saying, but, uh, but this is what we did together. I'm repenting now. But the fellow is not wanting to repent. If you die in that condition, you're trying to save your face. You're trying to save your name. And you're trying to pretend as if there is nothing. God knows everything. And he says, I know that works. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He says, I know. We're coming back to Revelation chapter 2. We're talking about this Jesus Christ who is the final judge. This Jesus Christ who is the all-knowing judge. This Jesus Christ who is the impartial judge. And this Jesus Christ who is the incorruptible judge. And we're coming to Revelation chapter 2 verse 13. It says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. It says, I know your situation." I know your circumstances. I know where you are living. I know the people around you. I know the neighbors around you. I know the places you go. I know the places you dwell. I know everything about you. What the church does not know. What the angel to the church of the church in Pagamos does not know. I know everything. I know where thou dwellest. Look at verse 13. And even where Satan's seat is. He said, I know, I can recognize the seat of Satan, and I can recognize the place where you are. Number one, he knows your dwelling place. Number one, he knows the society in which you are living. Number one, he knows the situation in which you are living. Number two, he knows your steadfastness. If you are steadfast, I pray God will help you to be steadfast. He says, even in the place where Satan sits, and thou holdest fast my name, thou holdest fast my name. You see, that's the characteristic of a child of God. The one that is born again and say, yes, I know idolatry is there. I will not serve idol. They put pressure on him. They bring trial on him. They deny him of this, deny him of that. He says, whatever I lose, whatever happens, I'm going to stand fast. You will stand fast. He knows your situation, number one. Number two, he knows your steadfastness. Look at Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 1. Verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. It says you stand fast, you hold fast. What you believe, you hold it fast. What you stand for, you hold it fast. Temptation will come. If there, if there are no temptation, there will be no testing. And we will not know how solid you are. We will not know how firm you are. We will not know how rigid you are. We will not know how committed you are to Christ and when that temptation comes when that trial comes when I say that will try to push you away from your steadfastness comes you say no I have backbone I am going to stand second Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 hold fast if you hold something with a loose hand it will be taken away from you but sometimes you'll find a children a child has a toy and he loves that toy. And even when that child is sleeping, he's holding on to that toy. And if you want to pull it out of the hand of the boy, of the child, he's going to wake up because he's holding it fast. That's the way you are to hold what you believe. That even when you're sleeping, even when you're sick, even when you're tired, even when there's so much pressure, but you say, I'm holding on to this thing fast. The doctrines of the Bible, the standard of the word of God, you hold fast. It says, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing. Doctrine is good. That good thing, the scriptures are good. That good thing, your salvation is good. That good thing, sanctification is good. That sin, the ticket that takes us to heaven. What a better sin do you have? That good sin which was committed unto thee. Keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Number one, I know your situation and circumstances. Number two, I know your steadfastness. Number three, I know your single-mindedness. Come to Revelation chapter 2. 
Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Look at that, the single-mindedness. Whatever wind was blowing, whatever waves were blowing, and whatever the storm of life may come upon these people, you hold fast and you have not denied my faith. Even in those days when in Antipas, my faithful matter was laid among you where Satan dwelleth. Where Satan dwelleth. I pray that you'll be faithful to the very end. Look at Revelation chapter 3 verse 8. Revelation chapter 3 verse 8. It says, I know thy works. Behold, I've set an open door. I've set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word. And has kept my word. All the teaching of the word we are receiving, you'll keep in Jesus' name. The experiences of the Christian life that the word has brought to your life, you will keep in Jesus' name. It says, because thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. You'll not deny the name of the Lord. What happens to the people that deny the name of the Lord? At a time of trial, they deny the name of the Lord. At a time of poverty, they deny the name of the Lord. At the time of joblessness, they deny the name of the Lord. At the time of sickness, they deny the name of the Lord. At the time when it appears that the push is so much and the pressure is too much and their relatives are drawing them here and there, they say, well, I cannot stand anymore. These, my people, if I don't listen to them, the trouble is so much. And then they deny, I pray it will not happen to you. You will not deny the Lord. Say it for yourself. I will not deny the Lord. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. I want you to understand that sentence very well. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And there are some people they don't understand. Suffer and reign. Suffer and reign. Suffer and reign. Let me explain. Let's say for example, you're supposed to suffer for one hour. And then you are supposed to reign for 40 years. Isn't that good? I said, isn't that good? You're not suffering for 40 years and reigning for 40 years. No, you're suffering for just one hour and then you are reigning for 40 years. Think about a pregnant woman. Maybe she has you know, some pressures some pains and all that. And during the labor, just for a few days that she's going to suffer that pain and then she's going to have a child that will become a doctor that will become an engineer, that will become the president of a whole nation, that will become a popular person, and she says, I don't mind the suffering, I'll carry through. Even, you know, women, they know that they're going to suffer, they know they're going to have pain when they have, their, when they have pregnancy, but they still want children. Sisters who are here, do you want children? The Lord will answer your prayer. But you know, the pregnancy will bring us some suffering and some pain. But because you know, I'm going to give back to a doctor. Give me a good aim. I'm going to give back to an engineer. Another amen. Because we're going to reign. Because we're going to have something great. Because we're going to have something that will make us know that in this world, I didn't just come here empty-handed and I go away empty-handed. We don't mind the suffering. And because we're going to reign with Jesus Christ a thousand years. Think about that, the millennial reign. We're going to reign with him forever and ever and ever. Whatever little suffering of a moment, of a day, of a year, of this short life, I will stand. I will endure. And it doesn't matter at all because if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Look at this. If we deny him, what will happen? Tell me out loud. Tell me out loud. If we deny him before the politicians of today, he will also deny us. If we deny him before the bosses and the employers of today in our place, we cannot take our stand. We cannot say, no, I'm a believer. I'm a child of God. I cannot do that. If we deny him before our old, old man, 
a sinner, a French sinner, is committing sin with us. Now you say you are born again, and now the man comes, and then you deny Christ, he will deny you. If we deny him before, a woman, you know, you've been a sin partner before, and now you say you are born again, and the woman comes and he says, how about it? I hear that you're born again, born again, you've joined them, and then you bow your head, you drop your head. Answer her now, uh -uh, because, you know, uh, she will say this and that. You are denying Christ, the Lord will deny you. But if you say, yes, I became born again. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I have backbone. I'm standing now. I'm pre if I was looking for you, that I wanted to preach to you, that all the mess we're doing together, everything with my life is now over. I'm calling you, come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so you will get saved. I'm not going to go to hell with you. and You're not going to get to heaven with me. You stand for the Lord. The Lord will support you. Be strong in the Lord and be strong in the Lord and be courageous and say, Lord, here is where I stand. I will not compromise. You will not compromise in Jesus' name. And if you are unfaithful, you are denying him. It's okay. This is a little sin. Let me compromise a little. If you are unfaithful in a little sin, you are unfaithful in much. We're looking at Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also. So in March, you see, little by little, little just make a, 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 make a mighty ocean. If you deny the Lord in a little thing, it's just a little thing, just a little thing, little, little, little. You deny the Lord, you're unfaithful. In those little things, eventually, it becomes a big a problem on your hands. He that is faithful in that which is least, is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust, unfaithful in the least, is also unjust in that which is much. I pray that the Lord will keep you faithful. Yeah. Revelation chapter 17 verse 14. Revelation chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 14. It says, Revelation chapter 14 verse 7, uh, 17 verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. The Lamb shall overcome them. He, For he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. Look at this. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The unfaithful are not with him. I will be faithful. We come now to point number two. We're looking at the corrupting influence in the church. The corrupting influence in the church. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. And I'm reading now from verse 14. Revelation chapter 2 from verse 14. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And to eat things sacrifice unto idols and to commit fornication so as thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which sin I hate and then he says repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth corrupting influence in the church as we look at the church of uh, the church in Pagamos, we need to look at our own church to start with. Look at that little house fellowship, that little church there. And you are the leader, that house fellowship leader. You are the angel to the church of that house fellowship. And then you are a zonal leader. And then the, you carry responsibility and you carry the title. Do you go around at all? And then you are, if you're on the women's side, you're the women right there. And all those fellowships of the women in that zone, are you checking up on them? Do you ever go there at all? Do you ever minister to them at all? Do you know their lives at all? As corruption coming, as compromise coming, and then you are not even seeing anything. You are a father. And as a father in your family, your boys and girls, your sons and your daughters, do you you know their lives at all? Do you know whether they are born again? Do you know whether they are backsliding? Are you watching over them or is something coming in like compromise, like a corruption? And there you are like a mother over your children. Are you looking at them at all? Okay, are my children they are already more than 18. So, because they are more than 18 years of age, you are no more their mother. Oh, my children, they are more than 23, 24. Okay, because you are, they are more than 23, 24. You are no more their 
mother, you don't have any oversight on your children, and you don't have any control on your children. If you see something good, you cannot tell your children. If you see something bad and evil, you cannot tell your children that is bad. And there are people that are pastors of local churches, and they just come, they come in and they preach, and after they are preach, they are gone. It's only when the people, maybe they are sick, they only pray for them so that they can get healed. About the details of their lives, they know nothing. About the compromise, they know nothing. About the corruption, they know nothing. Or maybe they know, but they are too much afraid now. The pastors are afraid of their members. And they are no more ministering to them, so to save them from hell and to direct them to heaven because they are now afraid of their lives. They are afraid of nothing. They are afraid of empty air. They do not understand the ministry God has called them to. If you talk to your members, if you preach to your members, if you correct your members, if you help your members so that they will go the way towards seven, what are they going to do? They're not going to slap you even if they did. And they're not going to spit upon you even if they did. They're not going to do any harm to you even if they did. Are you afraid of that? And then you cannot point your people to heaven and say, this is the way, walk it therein. Maybe you are a region overseer. Maybe you are a state overseer. And you just come me to preach you are very careful you are meticulously careful and when you preach you cannot mention details of what the people are doing the areas of compromise in their lives or the areas of corruption we we'll preach a good message we we'll preach a literated message and we we'll say everything is tailor made to you know make people know that that is knowledge but the thing doesn't touch their lives we are afraid to mention their corruption we are afraid to mention their compromise Jesus did not do that. Said angel, leader, pastor, minister to the church of Pagamos. I'm talking to you that I, you are doing. I have something against you. I have something against you. What if you visited a medical doctor and then you thought you are just going for a medical exam and then the uh, medical doctor tells you, uh, my friend. You are okay here. You are okay here. I've looked at your blood. I've looked at this. I've looked. Everything is okay. But you have two life-threatening diseases. And quickly, if nothing is done about this, before the end of the year, you are gone. You leave this world. All the good, good things is said about your health, all that will not matter. These two life-threatening diseases that is pointing out, you, you have to really take care. What if that doctor is afraid? I don't want to tell this man about the life-threatening disease that he has, because if I tell him, I don't know what his reaction will be. He may not come to my hospital anymore. He may not like me. He may not recommend me to other people and I want him to recommend me at the cost at the expense of his life and then he dies like that his blood will be upon you that's why the Lord is calling you if you are the angel of the church in that house flesh, the angel of the church in that family the angel of the church in that zone the angel of the church in that district in that group or in that region that local government in that state is saying look at the condition of the church and we're going to do something about it Corruption will be cleansed out of the church. Compromise will be cleansed out of the church. As we look at this, the corrupting influence in the church, there are five, there are five things. Number one, the, number one is the corruption. Number two is the controversy. Number three is the compromise. Number four is the condemnation. Number five is the correction. Number one, the corruption. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication, the corruption, the corruption that's setting, because uh, they had people that had the attitude of Balaam. Balaam had been invited by Balak to come and curse the children of Israel. He tried and tried and tried and God, uh, God turned the curse into blessing. And yet he wanted the money that uh, Balak had promised him. And he saw that if he didn't uh, curse these people, 
they will not get the money. And he couldn't get the money because the Lord changed everything to a blessing. He says, okay, if I cannot curse them, I will corrupt them. Because it will still achieve the same goal. So he told the Balak, introduce the Moabites, the Moabite women unto them. And once they begin to commit fornication, that's all. God will forsake them. And that's what happened. And 24,000 of them died as a result of that because of the evil counsel of Balak, of Balaam. Now, the people in the church in Pagamos, they were doing the same thing because there were teachers there, the sound doctrine would be preached from the pulpit, and then there were other people there corrupting the people, and they'd be teaching them contrary to the sound doctrine that gets us saved, that gets us set fast, that gets us sanctified. And, become, and then the pastor just said, well, I've done my duty, I've preached the gospel to them, I've preached the word of God to them, whatever the other people are telling them behind, that's not my problem. It's your problem. I have a few things against thee because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Look at verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest, thou allowest, that permittest, that that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And so that's how corruption set in in that church. Number two is the controversy. Controversy. God said, I have something against you. I have controversy against you. When there is evil going on in your family, you don't have the backbone and the strength to correct it. When there is evil going on in your local church, you don't have any strength to correct it. You say, well, I'm not the pastor and I'm not going to allow them to hear that I'm the one that reported that individual. I know that he's a robber. I know that he's doing night business. I know that, you know, I know the things he does. I even know he's occultic. I know this and that, but they will not hear it from me because, um, you know, I don't want them to mention my name that I'm the one that told uh, the pastor this or that. God has a controversy with you. And he says, I have a few things against you. Because you allow, you permit that uh, person there who is teaching them the way Balaam taught uh, the Balak uh, to cast stumbling block of, uh, to the children of Israel. If you don't repent, judgment will come. I pray you will repent. Amen. Give me a good amen. amen. But looking at the controversy, this is in Jeremiah chapter 16. Jeremiah chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 16 verse 10, And it shall come to pass when thou shalt show these people all these words that they shall say. Wherefore, as the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us, or what is our iniquity, or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Look at verse 11. Then shalt thou say unto them, Because your fathers are forsaken me, says the Lord, and have walked after all the gods, and I have served them, and I have worshipped them, and I have forsaken Taking me and I have not kept my law, and ye have done worse than your fathers. Ye have done worse than your fathers. Look up here. As you look at uh, the churches, when, uh, when deeper life started, we used to make use of the example of, you know, the Methodist church. Look at how John Wesley preached, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then we'll say, look at the Methodist church now. And the Lord is saying, how about you now, deeper life? How about you now, deeper life? How did you start? Your fervency in evangelism. How did you start? Your emphasis on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. How did you start? Your understanding of restitution. How did you start? Your understanding of righteousness. That you live a practical righteous life. How did you start? That there will be no bribery or corruption. How did you start? That you will not marry an unbeliever or a divorced a woman or a divorced man. How did you start? That you will do the will of the Lord and go everywhere, preach the gospel to every creature. How are you today? 
How fervent are you today? How standing are you today? How standard are you today? How firm are you today on the word of God that we all knew, that we stood for at that time? It says you have done worse than your fathers. Are we doing worse than, you know, what happened to the Methodist church? What happened to the Salvation Army? What happened to all the churches that were fervent and they were forceful and they were fruitful at that time and later now they have cooled down? Are you not cooling down to you, Pastor? Are you not cooling down to you, overseer? Are you not cooling down to you, members of the church? That's why the Lord is saying, is saying, I have a controversy against you. I have something against you. We'll wake up today and compromise will get out of our midst in Jesus' name. Yeah. Number one is the corruption. Number two is the controversy. Number three is the compromise. Number three is the compromise. You see, we've read it in Revelation chapter two. They were teaching them now to eat things sacrificed to idols. They were telling them idols me said nothing after all you wouldn't have to pay for it the people are sacrificing to their gods the people are sacrificing to their religion and they bring a good plate of rice and they bring a, you know whatever it is just lay your hand on it and bless it and enjoy a good meal and then with the, and the people they are convincing them and i was saying salvation is in your heart Salvation is not what you is not in what you eat. Salvation is not in whether you eat this or you don't eat that. And Jesus said, Look at the church. The church is now eating things, sacrificed unto idols. And you are encouraging those idol worshippers that their sacrifice means something. They don't know your kind of ideology. They don't know the kind of policy you are having that idols mean nothing. They think that you agree with them in their sacrifice. And Jesus is saying, you are abandoning me. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 28. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. This is not just the word of man. It's the word coming from the Holy Ghost himself. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, essential things, important things, necessary to salvation important to salvation essential to our relationship with god to lay upon you no other body no greater body than these necessary things that she abstain from tell me meats offered to idols even if you're hungry there are kinds of food you must not eat meat offered unto idols and from blood and from things strangled tell me the rest Tell me out loud. I'm from fornication. Look up here. There is, uh, you know, the normal regular, the normal thing that people do fornication, which is bad. Do you know that there are people, there are people that they married a wife and there's no child. And then the doctors have said the problem is for the man. And the man will call his own wife. Think about that. And say, you know, we need to have children in this family. And I know privately between you and I, the problem is with me. So I don't mind. You can go out. Don't tell me whatever you do with anybody. Just bring pregnancy. And the mother of that man will call the daughter-in-law and say, has my son spoken to you? Yes, your son spoke to me. What did he tell you? He said I could go out and bring a pregnancy. And what are you looking at? Go out now. We understand, we know it, we know it's our son that has the problem. If you're a Christian, will a Christian do that? That's fornication. That's adultery. You'll not do that. You'll not say, my husband understands, understands that you want to sin against the Lord. My husband even counseled me, even pushed me, even suggested to me, go and do it. My husband said, he doesn't mind. Heaven minds. God minds. Christ minds, and then you bring in that child. After bringing in the child, then when the child is growing up, Mommy, I don't look like Daddy. What happened? What are you going to say? Mommy, my Daddy sometimes tells me something and shuts me up, and he says, Pastor. Mommy, why is my Daddy saying, Pastor? What are you going to say? 
We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15 and verse 16. Revelation chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 15 and verse 16. Look at the condemnation. It says, So as thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. It says, You don't have time to waste. You must repent now very quickly. Repent quickly or else I will come very quickly quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The condemnation and then we're looking at the correction. The correction. The correction it says repent. The correction. Repent. The correction. Repent. I pray we'll repent of anything that is not of God in our lives in Jesus name. Look at chapter 2 verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove the candlestick out of his place except thou tell me repent we're looking at chapter 3 and we're looking at verse we're looking at verse 19 chapter 3 verse 19 it says in verse 19 as many as i love i rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore tell me and repent number three now is the crowning inheritance of conquerors we're coming to revelation chapter 2 verse 17 revelation chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 17 revelation chapter 2 verse 17 it says he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches if we have ears to hear and we hear what the spirit says unto the churches what's going to be the result look at some 81 some 81 we're looking at verse 8 some 81 and we're reading here from verse 8 if we have ears to hear here it says here oh my people and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me. If thou wilt hearken unto me. What's the result? Look at, uh, verse, uh, look at verse 13. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me. And Israel had walked in my ways. When he says, if ye have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. If we hear, if we listen. If we carry out what he's telling us, he says in verse 14, I shall soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against the adversary. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him and their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. He says, that's the result of hearing. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Come back now to Revelation chapter 2. I'm looking Looking at uh, verse 17, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, what does that mean? To him that overcometh, what do we overcome? What's he talking about? To him that overcometh. Uh, let's look at uh, Numbers, Numbers uh, chapter 13. In Numbers chapter 13, uh, we're looking at verse 30 and verse 31. Numbers chapter 13, uh, we're reading from verse 30 and verse 31. It tells us in verse 30, it says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once. And possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. What, what, what was the problem with them? They had the fear of the giants. The fear of the giants. That's the reason why they couldn't enter into the land of Canaan, into the land of promise. If there were no giants in the land, everybody would have gotten, would have got there. If there were no giants that is pushing them or making, pushing them back and giving them fear in their heart, they would have uh, gone into the land of promise. I'm asking you, which giant are you fearing in your life? If there were no problems, no opposition, no persecution, no giant, nothing for you to fear, where would you be? What will you do? What mountain will you climb? What challenges will you face? What is keeping many people back from success and victory is the fear of the giants. And it says, uh, uh, this Caleb said, we are well able to overcome. I will overcome. 
you overcome the fear of giants. Understand, every time you fear a giant, whatever the giant is, the giant may be a little cockroach. The giant may be a little, you know, a little sin, a little problem. The giant may be that a little sin, you're sleeping at night and something is, uh, you know, trying to oppress you there. The giant may be the frowning face of a particular man. Look at the place you are going. Look at the mountain you are climbing. Look at the success before you. Look at the victory before you. You must overcome the fear of the giant. I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 23. In Jeremiah chapter 23, and I'm reading here from verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 23, and we're looking at uh, verse 9. It tells us in verse 9, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 9, it says, My heart within me is broken because of the prophets and all my bones shake i am like a man drunken man like a man whom wine has overcome i'm like a man whom wine has overcome why because of the lord and because of the words of his holiness verse 10 the land is full of adulterers and be, for because of swearing the land money and the pleasant the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up and they and the call their cause is evil and their force is not right you know what there were false prophets in the land of israel at that time and when jeremiah looked at him he said i'm like a man that is overcome with drink I'm like a man that is overcome with wine because of the falsehood in the preachers. You know, sometimes if you don't overcome that, and there are preachers you have heard, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then other preachers come, they say, no, just be, just be good and do the best you can. Everybody is going to heaven. How can God throw anybody to hell? The falsehood of the preacher. The word of God says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And the false preachers come and they say, holiness, holiness. Who can be holy? There's nobody who can be holy. Everybody is going to be sinning until they die. And then, if you don't overcome the falsehood of the preachers, you cannot get there. That's what Jesus said. He that overcometh. And thank God I'm going to overcome. We're looking at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 21. Luke chapter 11. We're reading from verse 21. In Luke chapter 11, verse 21, look at what the Lord is saying in this verse 21. He says in verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when he's stronger than he shall come upon him and tell me. And overcome him. If there's something that is, you know, standing in your way. If you're not stronger than that thing. If there is a falsehood that is standing in your way. And you're not stronger than that thing. If there is an opposer that is standing in your way. And you're not stronger than that. You're trying to evangelize. And you're trying to take souls out of the hand of people who are keeping them in captivity. As long as they remain strong. All those people they're keeping in captivity. They remain there. But if you're going to get those souls out of their hands you'll be stronger that greater strength will come upon you that greater power will come upon you it says in verse 22 there in verse 22 it tells us here it says but when it's stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him he take it from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoil you must overcome the force of evil the force of evil. You see, there's a force of evil all around us, in our communities, in our schools, in our colleges, in our universities. Anywhere you go, there are forces of evil. And if you are beating back, if you are afraid, if you, if you don't remember, you must be an overcomer. Because anywhere you go, there are forces that will try to hinder you from doing the will of God and from moving forward. But he that overcometh, he that overcometh, number one, you overcome the fear of giants. Number two, you overcome the falsehood in preachers. Number three, you overcome the force of evil. We're looking at Romans chapter, Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 12, we're looking at verse 17. In verse 17, here is what he tells us, recompense to no man evil for evil. You know, if uh, when people do evil to you, they speak against you, 
you, they insult you, they assault you, they throw things at you. The tendency is to want to take vengeance, is want to throw something back to them. It says recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Then be beloved, avenge not yourselves. Give me a good amen there. But rather, give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, tell me, feed him. If he thirst, tell me, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Verse 21, everybody, one, two, three, go. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Look up here. You are a nice person. You are a soft person. You are a happy person. You are a cheerful person. You are a smiling person. And normally, if nothing happens, always smiling, always rejoicing, always cheerful, always thinking good of people. But here comes somebody. You didn't even offend him. You're just going your way, minding your business, and the fellow, you know, does something to you that can make an average person angry. And you allow that person to take your smile away from you. He has overcome you. You allow that person to take your gentleness away from you. He has overcome you. You have allowed that person to jolt you and to kind of jerk you and to make you forget the love that God says, love everyone, love your enemies and love your neighbors and love them as you love yourself. And that's who you are normally until they come and they push you here and pull you there and do that. And you allow them to overcome you and take your normal character, your cheerfulness away from you. You have not overcome. You have not overcome. And everywhere you go now, you are angry. Everywhere you go now, you are suspicious. Everywhere you go now, the, your normal self, your normal cheerfulness, your normal joy, and your normal smile, everything is now gone. Are you going to continue like that? Tonight, things will change. Because it says you overcome evil with good. And don't allow evil to overcome you. You must overcome the force, the fury, and the vengeance of your enemies. You must overcome the fury and the vengeance of the enemy. I'm looking at First John, First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 14. And from verse 13 and verse 14. Look at this. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Look at this. I've written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. Strong people, ye are strong. Yeah. And the word of God abideth in you. And uh, tell me, and, uh, and make it personal. And uh, you have overcome the wicked one. You know, sometimes look up here for a moment. Uh, when somebody is, you know, the fellow is weak. The fellow is, you know, down. The fellow does not know anything at all. But he just wants to show his uh, ignorance and little strength. And it's always, I'll punch you. I'll beat you. I'll strike you. And all that. It's not really striking. He doesn't have that strength and doesn't have that authority. And then second day, he comes, I will strike you. I will punch you. I will torment you. I will do this to you. And you never thought anything about it. Oh, then it sees you again. I'll punch you. I'll do this. I'll do all of a sudden. You're thinking of what he may do. You're thinking of what he can do. You're forgetting Christ. You're paying attention to him. 
You're looking at him. I'll punch you. I'll, he's saying that all the time. He can do nothing. And Christ can do everything. And he shifts your focus and shifts your attention away from Christ. Just the bragging makes you to forget Christ who lives in you. And then you're looking at him. Every time you see him now, even though he's nobody, he's nothing. Because you have exalted him above Christ who lives in you. You are now afraid of him. And then you begin to tremble. And then you forget the promise of God, you forget the direction where you are going. Wake up. You are better than that. You are higher than that. And you are greater than all those people. And because the greater one abides in you from tonight, you go out there and when they see you now, the table will turn. They'll be afraid of you. Because you must overcome. You must overcome the fierceness of the wicked one. The fierceness of the wicked one. I'm looking at five, I'm looking at uh, first Peter, Second Peter here, chapter two. Second Peter here, chapter two, and I'm reading from verse nineteen. Second Peter chapter two, verse nineteen. It says, "While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome." Of the same is he brought into bondage. Of the same is he brought into bondage. You must overcome the filthiness of corruption. The filthiness of corruption. They come and they promise you this, promise you this. You have most, you have all things already. Because if God did not spare his only begotten son and he gave him all for us all, how much more shall he give us all things richly to enjoy and freely to enjoy? And the Lord will give you everything you ask him in Jesus' name. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and tell me the rest. All these things shall be added unto you. I have all things in Christ. You have salvation, you have sanctification, you have holiness, you have the promises, you have material things, you have wife, you have husband, you have children, you have miracle, you have all things in Christ. And anytime you open your mouth, say, Lord, look at what I need before you finish praying, it will come. I will do what God says I can do. All the filthiness of corruption we throw them away. We don't need them. You overcome the flesh and the world. We're looking at First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. I see the overcomers here tonight. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. Who is he? that overcomes the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Any believer here tonight? You believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You're an overcomer. Be an overcomer. Be who you ought to be. My brothers and sisters, we are going to overcome. How do we overcome? Number one, we overcome by faith. By faith by faith because it says you take the shield of faith by which you're able to quench all the folly darts of the wicked one number two you overcome by fortitude fortitude that means uh, you overcome by courage you overcome by courage because who are you afraid of pharaoh is falling already who are you afraid of? Nebuchadnezzar is falling already. Who are you afraid of? Herod is under judgment already. Who are you afraid of? The powers of this world conquered already by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Therefore, be strong and be courageous. You are going to win the day. We overcome by faith. We overcome by fortitude. We overcome by fearlessness. Fearlessness. That's what Jesus said. He said, my friends, I'll tell you. Luke chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. That you should not be afraid of a man who can kill the body. But after that, he has nothing he can do. I will forewarn you. Who will fear? You fear God who is able to kill and then able to drive that soul into hell. There's fearlessness. We don't fear anybody. You'll not fear anybody. Number one, we overcome by fortitude. Number two, we overcome by fearlessness. Number three, we overcome by faithfulness. And the Lord has said in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. It says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. That she may be tried. Just try her. Just try her. That she may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation, little trouble, ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life and we overcome by following Christ. Step by step, 
following Christ. Day by day, following Christ. One day at a time. One day at a time. Look at the challenge of today. I will overcome today. And when I get to tomorrow, I'll overcome tomorrow. When I go to the next day, day by day and step after step. Because Jesus Christ, he has left us an example that we should follow his steps by following Christ. We overcome by fighting the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith. The flesh wants to trouble you and pull you down. We say flesh, I'll fight you. That's your flesh. And you put that flesh under in Jesus' name. I put my body under. I put my eyes under. I put my ears under. I put my all my flesh under control so that after I preach to other people, I will not be a castaway. Somebody there, you'll not be a castaway. I see you a candidate for heaven. A candidate for glory. And all those things that tried, they want to draw you back. No, you've gone too far. You cannot go back now. You've suffered persecution. You have endured. You have suffered their you know, position. You have endured. And you have worked for the Lord. And you are serving the Lord. And just remains a little step now. And we get to the land of promise. And then somebody comes and he says, I want to drive you back. You say, it's too late. I've gone so far. I'm on one step, and then you are there in glory. And nobody at this late hour will, will get you back in Jesus' name. And so you fight the good fight of faith. And then you say, Lord, here am I. I'm going to stand for you. Here am I, Lord. That crown waiting for me, nobody will take my crown. And then he says, if you overcome, you are going to overcome. I said, you are going to overcome. Look at verse 17. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to each of the hidden manna. There's a hidden promise waiting for you. There's a hidden manna waiting for you. And then it says, I will give him the white stone, and in the white stone a new name written, which no man knoweth except he that receiveth it. A special blessing. A peculiar blessing every day of your life if you live the overcoming life no matter what you need strength from above power from above and all the provision of the lord will be flowing into your life every time in jesus name compromise we cancel it corruption we cancel it and all the things the world they are trying to do so that we don't overcome we say no to everything coming from the world in jesus name we will stand we will hold fast and this gospel the pure gospel the total gospel that the lord has given us we're going to keep until the final day in jesus name i pray that the lord will give every one of us every one of you the spirit of the conqueror you'll be more than a conqueror and every day the blessings of god will be multiplying in your life are you still there are you going to pray why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, here I am. Oh Lord, here I am. I'm going to have everything you have promised. I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to falter. I'm not going to bend. I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to be corrupted by the world. I will be an overcomer. The Lord will help you. You'll be an overcomer. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord.